right, hello everyone. So before we get started, Third Place Books would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present, and uh, an honor with gratitude of the Duwamish people and the land itself. So welcome everyone to our virtual event space. My name is Allie. You might recognize me from our Lake Forest Park location and I'm your host for this evening. I am so excited to be introducing two incredible poets tonight, Kelly Russell Agadon and Maggie Smith here to discuss their collections Dialogues with Rising Tides and Goldenrod. But before we get into the good stuff on behalf of all of us here at Third Place Books, I just wanna thank you all so much for tuning in. For those of you who may not know, we are an independent bookstore with three locations in the Seattle area. And as much as we miss having these events in our bookstores, it has been such a delight to expand this online program to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in. And of course, for buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. So if you haven't gotten your hands on copies of the books that come up this evening and you would like to, I will be linking them in our chat. For those of you in the Seattle area, come on in, grab copies right off the shelf, or you can place an order online and come pick them up. Um, or if you're not local or not leaving the house, we of course ship. So go ahead and leave those links in chat, uh, follow those links in chat over to our website. Uh, while you're on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in this new year, including an event or two in person, which is very exciting. Uh, if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases our online book clubs, and of course, follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. So tonight, we are here for about an hour, and towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have questions, which we love it when you do, so leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen. It is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause connecting with each other, I absolutely invite you to share where you're tuning in from in our chat right now. We love to hear from you, uh, but when it comes time for questions, do make sure those end up in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. While you're in our chat and question spaces, I do want to remind you to please lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. For anyone interested, there are auto-generated closed captions available from the menu at the top or bottom of your screen. Select live transcript uh, to enable or disable them. And finally, should any technical issues arise, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them. And we appreciate always your patience and understanding. And all right, I think that is all of my housekeeping. So it is time to settle in because without uh, further ado, I am so pleased to welcome two wonderful poets. First, Kelly Russell Agadon, author of the Forward Indies Book of the Year and Poetry winner and Washington State Book Awards finalist, Letters from the Emily Dick Dickinson Room, Washington State Book Prize finalist, Hourglass Museum, The Daily Poet, Day by Day Prompts for Your Writing Practice, and Fire on Her Tongue, an anthology of contemporary women's poetry. She's the co-founder of Two Sylvia's Press, has received numerous awards and fellowships, and her work has appeared in The Atlantic, The Nation, Harvard Review, and Oprah Magazine. The book tonight is Dialogues with Rising Tides, which grapples with the forces that threaten to take us under with vulnerability and a little dark humor. And our next poet this evening is Maggie Smith, award-winning and best-selling author of Goldenrod, Good Bones, The Well Speaks of Its Own Poison, Lamp of the Body, Keep Moving, Notes on Loss, Creativity and Change, and Keep Moving the Journal. Her poems have, and essays have appeared on the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Southern Review, the Guardian, the Paris Review, the Washington Post, and Best American Poetry. Uh, Public Radio International called her viral poem, Good Bones, the official poem of 2016. Um, the book tonight is Goldenrod, which looks at parenthood, solitude, love, and memory, and reveals the magic of the present moment. So 
thank you both so very much for being here. I'm going to go ahead and pass the stage to both of you. So welcome. Oh my gosh, I see the chat is blowing up. I love that. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi. Allie, thank you. Thank you so much, Allie. That was wonderful. And Kelly, thanks for inviting me to do this with you. Thank you for coming here. And I know because it's late at your house, 9 p.m. That's late for me. So it is 9 p.m., but that means it's also quiet because my children are maybe sleeping already. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, I will let you start. Okay. I'll read some poems and then I'll throw it to you. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from Goldenrod. And I love seeing where everyone is coming from. Um, hi, all out there. Um, so I'll read and then Kelly will read and then I hope you start to, um, as, as questions come to you, pop them in the Q&A before you forget them. If you're like me, if you wait till the end, you won't remember the question. <laughs> um, and um, we'll be sure to leave room to, to chat at the end. Um, I'll start with the title poem. This is Goldenrod. A no botanist. If you're the color of sulfur and growing at the roadside, you're goldenrod. You don't care what I call you, whatever you were born as. You don't know your own name. But driving near Peoria, the sky pink orange, the sun bobbing at the horizon, I see everything is what it is exactly, in spite of the words I use, black cows, barns falling in on themselves. You, dear flowers born with a highway view, forgive me if I've mistaken you, goldenrod, whatever your name is, you are with your own kind. Look, the meadow is a mirror full of you, your reflection repeating. Whatever you are, I see you wild yellow, and I would let you name me. Okay, this one's called uh, The Hum. It's not a question without the mark. How do we live with trust in a world that will continue to betray us? Hear my voice not lift at the end. How do we trust when we continue to be betrayed? For the first time, I doubt we'll find our way back. But how can we not? See how the terminal mark allows a question to dress a statement and vice versa. Sometimes, if I am quiet and still, I can hear a small hum inside me, an appliance left running. Years ago, I thought it was coming from my bones. The hum kept me company and I thought, thank God for bones, for the fidelity of bones. They'll be there until the end and then some. Now what? How to continue? I've started calling the hum the soul. Today I have to hold my breath to hear it. What question does it keep not asking and not asking? never changing its pitch. How do I answer? This poem has bones in it too. Um, apparently I can't stop writing about bones. Uh, it's called in the grand scheme of things, which is something I say a lot. Like, well, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a big deal. Um, and then I started thinking more about the phrase, uh, and, and that's really where this poem came from. In the grand scheme of things, it sounds like someone wound up the wrens and let them go. Let them chatter across your lawn like cheap toys, and from here an airplane seems to fly only from one tree to another, barely chalking a line between them. We say the naked eye, as if the eye could be clothed, as if it isn't the world that refuses to undress unless we turn our backs. It shows us what it chooses, nothing more, and it's not waxing pastoral. There is too much now 
at stake. The skeletal rattle you hear at the window could be only the hellion roses in the wind, their thorns etching the glass, but it could be bones. The country we call ours isn't, and it's full of them. Every year you dig that goddamn rose bush from the bed, spoon it from soil like a tumor, and every year it grows back thick and wild. We say, in the grand scheme of things, as if there were one. We say, that's not how the world works, as if the world works. Uh, this is a poem born in a place where one might think that poems would not be born, <laughs> uh, Twitter. Poem beginning with a retweet. If you drive past horses and don't say horses, you're a psychopath. If you see an airplane but don't point it out, a rainbow, a cardinal, a butterfly. If you don't whisper, shout, albino squirrel, deer, red fox. If you hear a woodpecker and don't shush everyone around you into silence. If you find an unbroken sand dollar in a tide pool. If you see a dorsal fin breaking the water. If you see the moon and don't say, oh my God, look at the moon. If you smell smoke and don't search for fire, if you feel yourself receding, receding, and don't tell anyone until you're gone. Okay. Um, the title of this poem is My Daughter's Birthday. And um, I wrote this one really quickly just sort of musing on what it means um, to be a newborn and to be sort of like the newest person um, at the party. December 18th, 2008. For just a fraction of a moment that afternoon, if we think of time as being a whole, you were the newest person in the world. You were the emptiest vessel on earth, knowing nothing of this place or of yourself, that you even were a self, that a self was something one could be, that one could be at all. And what was being? For that narrowest sliver of a whole, you were the least experienced person on earth, and then you weren't. You knew me before you knew your own body, what to do with your hands, your pink fists battering your face. We swaddled you as if against that confusion, though I tell you that confusion never leaves. The body remains a house unaware of its rooms. Okay, I've got a few more flagged. This is a tough one. This, this poem took me a lot of time to write, years and years. It seems like something so small um, should be rather quick in coming. And um, I find that's not the case, at least for me. It takes me an awfully long time to write some poems. The last one was fast and this one, this one was slow. Uh, it's called Half Staff. Why don't we leave the flags at half staff and save ourselves the trouble? Save the kids in coats and hats on flag duty in the snow. That morning, I sat in traffic by the school, waiting for the light to change, and there they were, pulling the rope hand over hand over hand. First thought, do children lowering the flag at an elementary school, no, it's for children shot dead at another. Then the minivan behind me honked, red to green. So often I'm reminded the body is built for ending. How have we not evolved past these temporary containers? 
I mean, what a place to keep everything, everything. Four days after Sandy Hook, I walked my daughter to her classroom, kissed her head, wished her happy birthday, and sent her inside. So often, the mind whispers to the body, I am not safe here. And the body never bothers to answer. Because what could it say? Okay, I wrote this um, when my son was a baby. Um, he was born in the fall. And so we had spent a lot of time inside. Um, I'm in Ohio, so it gets, it gets very cold here in November, December, January, February, March. Frankly, sometimes it snows in April here. Um, and so we had spent a lot of time inside and it finally thawed enough for me to take him out in the little front load carrier. And, um, and that's really what inspired this poem. Although it sort of feels like a, a pandemic staying in the house poem to me now. It's called First Thaw. You must think this house is the world, the oven door a dark mirror in which to learn your face. We've been inside so long, you don't know a living thing when you see one through the window, grackles blacking the dead grass, sycamores bone white and eerily double jointed. I bundle you to my chest and step outside, opening the umbrella. This is the world, a room that goes on and on, no walls, no buckling plaster or cracked ceiling. New as you are, you aren't the only novice here. What I thought was a bird, a large, low-flying white bird, is a plastic bag. Even the rain knows only one shape. Look, it's drawing circles on the puddles. Okay, I think I'll just read two more and then I'll throw it over to Kelly and I can't wait to hear her read. Um, this is a, a pandemic poem and it felt sort of past tense for a while, post-vax, po uh, post-boost. Uh, when I could go out and about. And now um, I'm sort of hunkering down again. And so this, this poem feels very present to me again, um, almost two years later. Uh, during lockdown, I let the dog sleep in my bed again. Last night, my daughter cried at bedtime of loneliness, she said. She's seen the graph, the jagged mountain we need to press into a meadow. And maybe she pictures the drive home from Southern Ohio, how the green hills flatten without us doing a damn thing. No sacrifice required. I tell her the steep peak makes loneliness our work, makes an honorable task of it. But I shut myself in the bathroom and cry hard into a hand towel. I walk alone in the snow, squinting up into the big wet flakes letting them bathe my face. I tell myself it is a kind of touch. I tell myself it will do. And then I'll end here. Um, this is from, from Pandemic Walks and the, the little treasures that my son leaves um, either in his pockets or in mine that, um, that I carry for luck. It's called Talisman. They look like gifts a crow might bring a human girl, desperate to impress her. In the left pocket of my thrifted emerald coat, a scuffed acorn, a glassy black stone, one pink Mr. Potato Head ear. When I touch them, I can believe almost anything. Who's to say they can't keep me safe? Who's to say a bird can't court someone's daughter? But in this life, it's my son who shows his love like a creature that clever, leaving treasures for my fingers to worry against. I carry them like anything I love until they warm in my palm, until I believe. Walking alone at night, 
the sky feathered blue black and slowly folding over me, I pocket my left hand and tell myself a story about my life, a story I call talisman, a story that might end well if I tell it right. Thank you. Kelly, I can't wait to hear your poems. I'm going to vanish now. <laughs> I'm here and I'm unmuted. Oh my gosh, Maggie, thank you. Um, it was so wonderful to hear your poems. Um, I think we're set. So thank you, Allie, for that beautiful introduction. And um, thank you, Maggie, for your work. If you don't have Goldenrod, um, you need to get it. Maggie's work is so powerful. And, you know, she just keeps getting better. And I'm honored and thrilled to read with her because she's not only one of my favorite poets, she's also a friend. So um, she couldn't hear me when she was reading, but I was, you know, like, oh, yeah. I was applauding and nobody could see me on screen, but that's me. So thank you all for coming and sharing your, your Wednesday evening with us. Um, it's just, we have such a wonderful poetry community. And so there's so many names in the chat that I saw that um, I'm just really thankful that you showed up. Um, it is hard to launch a book during the pandemic. This is what I'll be reading from tonight, Dialogues with Rising Tides from Copper Canyon Press. Thank you, Copper Canyon. Um, so when we get these moments where we all can kind of join in together, it's really special. Um, I always try, so if you show up to a reading, I'm glad, please ask questions um, because I always feel like if you show up, you should get a little bit more than what you normally get when you read a book. Um, so I'm going to share a story with you and then I'm going to start reading as it's been a tough month and well, that's an understatement. It's been a tough like two years, but um, I was having a tough week and I said last night or the other night, um, hey universe in my head, give me a sign. And the next morning I woke up and there was a baby eagle actually in the water uh, it looked like it was swimming and I thought is that a loon and it was a baby eagle and it got up and then it came back and it caught a fish right in front of me. Um, so then I was driving home last night and I was talking to a friend and they were telling me about a very spiritual um, event that had happened to them and I started thinking about um, did I get a sign? And I, I was like, well, was that eagle a sign? Um, and, you know, it's very entitled, like, oh, of course, the eagle's not good enough. Um, but I was like, was that my sign or wasn't it? So as I'm thinking this, the most beautiful coyote, because I said in my head, I think I'd like another sign, a beautiful coyote walked across the street. If coyotes can be calico, this was a calico coyote. I also love it when people say, coyote or coyote, I say coyote. So long story to why I'm going to read the first poem in my book, and you'll understand why. And this poem also has a lot, has bones in it. It's called Hunger. Hunger. If we never have enough love, we have more than most. We have lost dogs in the neighborhood and wild coyotes. And sometimes we can't tell them apart. Sometimes we don't want to. Once I brought home a coyote and told my lover that we had a new pet until it ate our chickens, until it ate our chickens, our ducks, and our cat. Sometimes we make mistakes and call them coincidences. We hold open the door then wonder how the stranger ended up in our home. There is a woman on our block who thinks she's eating bunnies, feeding bunnies, but they are large rats without tails. Remember the farmer's wife? Remember the carving knife? 
We are all trying to change what we fear into something beautiful. But even rats need to eat. Even rats and coyotes and the bones on the trail could be the bones on my plate. I ordered Cornish hen. I ordered duck. Sometimes love hurts. Sometimes the lost dog doesn't need to be found. This next poem is dedicated to Maggie because it was a request. And um, it's another poem about birds, this time um, magpies. And there's a part in this poem where I talk about Forever 21. And that actually was a choice. I had to figure out what store I wanted to put in this poem. Um, sometimes you just have to make decisions. So I was going between World Market and um, American Eagle, but uh, Forever 21 won out and I think you'll understand the vibe. So magpies recognize themselves in the mirror. The evening sounds like a murder of magpies and we're replacing our cabinet knobs because we can't change the world, but we can change our hardware. America breaks my heart some days, and some days it breaks itself in two. I watched a woman having a breakdown in the mall today, and when the security guard tried to help her, what I felt was all of us peeking from her purse as she threw it across the floor into Forever 21. And yes, the walls felt like another way to hold us. And when she finally stopped crying, I heard her say to the fluorescent lighting, some days the sky is too bright. And like that, we were her flock in our black coats and white sweaters. Some of us reaching our wings towards her and some of us flying away. Speaking of bright lights, I feel like I'm being interrogated by my Zoom light tonight. It's so dark. I'm out in my writing shed. So this is where I do Zoom readings and this is where I read during the pandemic or where I wrote during the pandemic. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I'm talking as if the pandemic is over. So um, along, since, we've, since I've been reading about animals, um, I wanted to read about otters because they're just such playful, joyful uh, creatures. And sometimes I see them playing on the beach and I think just how much our human problems are our human problems or so-called problems. And they're out there just playing and I love that about them. I mean, we can all learn from that playfulness, they, but they're not doom scrolling or listening to the news. They're just in the moment. So this one's for the otters. It's called what I call erosion. Today's sea seems tired of stealing acres of sand from the beach. What I call erosion, the waves call I wish the wind would stop rushing us. I wish we could just take it slow. In the beauty of white caps, I sometimes see sadness. Sometimes how lucky we are to watch the sunrise one more time. There's so much we're carrying these days. An osprey clutches a fish in its talons. A killdeer runs across the dunes, trying to distract us from its nest. Danger, even when it's not, is everywhere. Sometimes I pretend I have a broken wing as I look out the window, but then a cloudscape in a world of buffalo heads, of saltwater ro roses, 
and I forget fear. It's 7 a.m. on a Thursday, and an otter is pretending none of my concerns matter. An otter, if laughter were a mammal, dives in and out of the waves playful. When the planet says, this is impossible, the otter responds, only if you believe it. I was going between these two poems um, to read. I've had a lot of animals, so I think I'm going to add some queens to the mix. Um, I'm obviously interested in words because I'm a poet, but I, I really pay attention to um, just the language that we live in and, and, you know, how some people still say fireman instead of firefighter, um, you know, or something was man-made instead of human-made. Our language is becoming more um, inclusive, I hope, to have others. But I was thinking about a game, two games, chess and checkers. And I started thinking about the term king me, because that's what you get. And then your chip becomes the most powerful on the board. So I wrote a poem called Queen Me. Queen Me. Playing chess, I realize how tired I am of the patriarchy. How the winning move involves the king the useless piece who can only skate square to square. When playing checkers, I taught my daughter to say as she slides her plastic red chip the full length of the board, queen me. It returns to my youth when I wanted to play baseball and the coach said, girls can only play softball and, and toss me what looked like a small leather planet. Queen me, I wanted to say when I couldn't be captain of the kickball team, couldn't play Santa in the school show. Queen me, my daughter says to the neighbor boy, who without question places another checker on her piece. Later, I hear him say to my daughter, queen me as they begin another game. Queen me, he says, again and again, as the universe begins to shift, like a tilted tiara, finally made right. So I'm going to read, I think I'm going to read two more poems. Thank you all for being here tonight and listening. So there are times where Sometimes we're just in love with the world. Um, and uh, this poem was one where when you have that feeling, it's just, it's such a good feeling. You just feel connected. And, and this poem was kind of um, inspired by that moment. It's called Love Waltz with Fireworks. 17 minutes ago, I was in love with the cashier and a cinnamon pull apart. Seven minutes before that, it was a gray-haired man in Argyle socks, a woman dancing outside the bakery, holding a cigarette and broken umbrella. The rain, I've fallen in love with it many times. The fog, the frost, how it covers the clovers. And by clovers, I mean lovers. And now I'm thinking, how much I want to rush up to the stranger in the plaid wool hat and tell him I love his eyes. All those fireworks, every 17 minutes exploding in my head. You the baker, you the novelist, you the reader, you the homeless man on the corner with the strong hands. I've thought about you, but in this world, We've been taught to keep our emotions tight. A rubber band ball where we worry if one band loosens, the others will begin shooting off in so many directions. So we quiet, I quiet. 
I eat my cinnamon bread in the bakery, watching the old man still sitting at his table, holding his handkerchief as he drinks his small cup of coffee. And I never say, I think you're beautiful, except in my head, except I decide I can't live this way. I walk over to him, place my hand on his shoulder, lean in close and whisper, I love your Argyle socks. And he grabs my hand the way a memory holds tight in the smallest corner. He smiles and says, I always hope someone will notice. I read um, a Danusha Lamaris poem called Small Kindnesses that I always consider um, the sister poem to that. Uh, it's, if you can look up that poem, it's from her book, Bonfire Opera. It's another wonderful one. So thank you all. Um, I'm gonna read one more. This is Dialogues and this is the new manuscript. It's official because it's in this orange folder. So I'm going to read you a poem I have not read to anyone. Um, yeah, I haven't read it to anyone except maybe my cats because I read my poems out loud. So thank you all for listening. Oh, and the title of this poem is um, a line from Laura Kiskaiski. I think I'm saying Kaziski, Kaziski. I always thought it was Kishkaish, but it's Laura Kaziski. And it's called, The Secret is That the World Loves You. Because there is fluttering when you thought there'd be flood water, you trust a friend's hand on your hip when she spins satellite, satellites until your universe is full tilt, pinballing planets. But you've got your quarters ready against the glass, and while you exist in high water jeans, the world loves how you smile at sticky children. How when no one was, noti when no one was noticing, you tucked $20 into the pocket of a stranger asking for change. Sometimes it's almost too easy to be helpful to make a million friends because you're not spraying pesticides across your lawn and the grasshoppers and cocoons thank you. And while you aim to unwind with hibiscus, hollyhocks, anything that gives you a little buzz, you really adore hum hummingbees, honeybees, how their world is alive and humming. And today the cliff, squ cliff swallows returned and the pair of golden eyes you love floated across the lake. They're still together another year, seasonal monogamy. We're hanging in there knowing love is love is love and also temporary. Like all of us, that summer where everything fluttered, all those afternoons, the monarchs landed in your hair. Thank you all for listening and sharing the space with Maggie and I tonight. Oh my gosh, I love that last poem so much. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing with us. So we are gonna go ahead and switch over to questions. So. If there are questions, I see that there are some here. Um, and if you have more audience members, go ahead, throw them in the Q&A. We always love when you ask questions. So let's start with this from Kevin. Um, as a poet, I gravitate to the same images in a lot of my po poetry. Uh, do you find yourself doing the same thing? <laughs> I love that. Nodding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, and I used to feel kind of bad about it. Um, I used to feel kind of bad about it. Like, oh, uh, I remember giving a reading from, from my book, Good Bones, once, and somebody in the Q&A said, so what's with all the birds? Which I thought was a funny question, and I, I wasn't quite sure how to answer it. I, I think I used to be a little self-conscious about 
how, um, how much I return to the same landscapes, the same images, the same material, the same worries and concerns and celebrations in my poems. And then after a while, I was like, oh, I think that's just my stuff. Like maybe that's just my territory. That's like my field to walk. And I'm just gonna pace it until I die. Um, and as long as I'm not writing the same poem over and over, it's okay if um, a lot of the ingredients are, are reused and repurposed. Yeah. So like, what I, about you? I'm curious. I agree. I have the same, um, the same themes and and I think when a poet like returns to certain images like you we begin to associate it with that poet and it becomes a touchstone you know for for that poet and it it makes that image I think even stronger um, you can even do that like in a manuscript if you keep returning to a certain image and it kind of means something so yes both in images and both in themes um, I I hope I continue to try like you, Maggie, to stretch myself so that while I'm still writing about these, I'm also writing about it now older. So we're changing as, um, so the perspective we had on maybe a theme or topic we were writing about, you know, 20 years ago or 10 years ago is different now. So good question. Yeah. yeah, I think too about, I mean, I think about somebody like James Wright, who, if you go back to a book like The Branch Will Not Break, uses words like good and dark in every single poem. And they're not even like fancy $10 words. Um, and, but I, you know, if I were workshopping that, maybe we'd be like, you know, could you say something other than dark? Or maybe you've used good like four times in this poem already. Could you use a synonym? But when I read those poems, I don't want it to be any other way because it feels right. Um, it feels right to me. So sometimes I think we just have to lean in yeah, that's like Lee and Lee's book, you know, the the brother's boots and the reoccurring and, um, you know, he might, the, the book Rose, if you haven't read it, everyone, order it from Third Place Books, Rose by Lee and Lee, same thing. The images keep going and writing the same poems, but it's stunning. Yeah, yeah. So our next question, uh, this is, hi, Maggie, it's from Shelby, um, fellow Columbus, Ohio, Ohioan, Ohioan. Ohioan, oh. <laughs> um, I love that you mentioned quite a few local places like parks, for example, in your poems, and was wondering if there are any specific places that you find most inspiring when writing. And I think that's a great question for both of you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, the short answer is no, there aren't like specific places. Um, I still, I mean, I've lived here my whole life. So there's not much new to see, except for that it's new every day. Like I was walking my dog this morning and looked up rounding a corner and saw this like cloud formation I'd never seen before and whipped out my phone from my pocket and started, you know, I'm that person, started taking photos of the sky while trying to control my terrier. Um, so I don't, there's really not any specific place here or anywhere that I find more inspirational than other places. I do like when I can see sky um, and I like being around trees. So if I can be outside or, or take a walk or sit, even my office is all windows. So sit looking out a window that tends to get my mind going or sitting outside at a coffee shop to do some writing rather than being in a space. Um, having like a wide vista <laughs> tends to help. Um, but but really most of what's happening, even when I'm writing about imagery or sensory detail, it's happening in here. It's almost always something from memory. So really I could be writing it in a closet. Um, I would just prefer not to. <laughs> Kelly, what about you? No, I'm exactly the same way. I'm a self-contained poet wherever I am. Um, you know, for me, the most inspiring thing is if ever I'm stuck and I, I don't know how to approach a poem or start a poem, I just read somebody else's poem, you know, like read a good Maggie Smith poem. And then the next thing you know, when you read poems that you love, that can usually, for me, um, make me write. And it doesn't matter where I am. I can be on a picnic. I can be in a grocery store. I can be waiting in line in a car. <laughs> 
it's sentences, right? Because I do the same thing. Like people are like, oh, you're going to go right. And I say, yes. And what I take with me to go right is money so I can buy myself a cup of coffee. Yes headphones so I can listen to music because I do listen to music while I write a notebook and a pen because I don't know how to type and so it's just better if I write longhand and somebody else's book of poems mm -hmm. and I almost always start any sort of writing session by reading and getting somebody else's rhythms into my mind or seeing a word or a phrase or a sentence construct that somehow reminds me of, oh, that one time, or oh, that one thing, or it leads me down this other path. I, I would love that. Yeah, no, I'm the same way. And and like, that's what YouTube has been so great too, because you can pull up your favorite poets and they're reading. Though I type on a laptop when I go out to write, because if I, I write so slow that I will end up not finish. I will, I'll, my critical mind will be like, no, not good enough, but I can type faster than my inner critic. So I type. Yeah, I can't type faster. But than I do write to music. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can write faster than my inner critic. So maybe that's the, that's the key. That's all you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> so following that question is a question from Leslie that says, um, are there any poets who we might not be reading that you could recommend that we read? Oh, my gosh. I know it kind of puts you on the spot. <laughs> I know. And yeah. I'm sitting I mean, here and I have all this like books around me. I don't know what people are reading. I guess that's the, that's the other thing. It's like, I don't know what people are reading. I'm looking at my desk. I have a stack of stuff here that I've been pouring through yeah. recently. And I've got, um, Rick two, Barrett is one. two Barbara Raz books here. This is the newest. If you don't know her work, holy moly. Um, it's just so good. And I've been pouring back through, um, Linda Gregg's new and selected. Yeah. What on earth? Like every time, and I've read it. Yeah. I've read this book probably all the way through maybe five or six times. And I keep dragging it back up to have beside my bed because it's thick enough that I can flip through and read a few and then fall asleep. And Every time I get to one of them, I'm just, I out loud, I either gasp or I'm just like, are you kidding me with this? Like, <laughs> she just said, what? Like, they're so good. It's just, I'm angry that I don't get to read more new poems by her. Oh. Like, when yeah. we lose a poet, we lose all of the poems that they would have written. Yes in whatever years they would have had. And, and I, I feel, I feel that way about Linda Gregg. Yeah. Um, well, I definitely agree with her. I just grabbed like my books I've been keeping around my Todd Davis and Dean Rader are two poets that I love and actually really nice people. Um, David Wu and Rick Barrett are, um, Laura, who I, Kesh Kaish, um, I've been reading and EJ Ko. I don't know. I, I I, I keep discovering new poets. I don't know about you. And then I'll be like, oh, wow, this is their third book. And I'm just discovering them. So I love it when people share their poems with me. Or I go down a rabbit hole and I, I'll go to the acknowledgements and I'll see the people they thanked or the people who blurbed their book or whatever. And then I go to them and then I find my way. It's like finding new music. Like, oh, yeah. this person played on this person's record. Well, now let's find their solo stuff. Right. And, and with poets, it's the same way. And I feel like I read a lot of poetry and I still am like coming late to things all the time. Like there's just so much. There's no shortage. Yes. I I have nothing more to add. My brain went, my brain just turned off on that question. <laughs> I know. It's always the worst when someone asks you, your, it's like being asked your favorite movie. I don't know. Have I ever seen a movie? Um, <laughs> so I did my best to keep up, <laughs> but I failed. So if, you know, I, I tried to keep up with the books, but that's what I, that's what I got. <laughs> so this is um, a question for Kelly, but I think is perfect for both of you. Um, do you think repetition in a poem can add to the tension, drawing more power from it? Absolutely. And Maggie's Good Bone, Bones poem does that. Um, repetition is such also a great way to bring music into your work. Um, and 
I love refrains. It's also helpful when you're writing a, a book or a poem and then you start like doing the refrain because sometimes you get stuck, but then it ends up being like a beautiful melody and sometimes you can take it out or, or leave it. Um, but yes, I do feel like it can um, raise the tension. Maggie, do you have anything to say? You use repetition too. I use repetition a lot. And I think, you know, for me, sometimes in the drafting phase, it's a way to sort of like build momentum. You know, like I'm kind of like revving the engine, trying to find my way into what I'm saying. And sometimes using anaphora, for example, like starting this, starting multiple sentences with the same phrase helps me sort of like drill down deeper into what it is I'm trying to say. Um, but also just as patterning, like I, I love, there is something so satisfying and this is so geeky, but there's just something so satisfying about using a word or phrase early in a poem and then seeing an opportunity to repurpose and reuse it maybe in a different way or in a, in a different context or verb the noun or noun the verb or flip it around or invert it and have it um, sort of echo, but not perfectly later in a poem. I don't know that there's anything quite like that, like little giddy rush I get when I can use scraps in different yeah. ways through something. Um, and I do think that's part of building tension. Like if you can sort of distort or twist or have the reader look at something that you've said in a new way because it's being re reused differently, I find that really exciting when I'm reading too. Like, oh, I see what they did there. Like, it makes yeah. me feel smart to notice that pattern being, you know, like that expectation being set and then maybe broken or changed. Yeah, and that's what you do really well. And it's something that I really admire about poets is what I always felt the difference between poetry and prose is prose marches on, prose moves forward, but poetry keeps circling back. It's and that repetition, Yes, and that repetition yeah. is a way to kind of circle back and then to rebring back an image in, in a surprising way. I love that. So this is from Amanda um, asking, what is your writing process and what are you currently working on? Which is a very exciting question because I just saw the orange binder. Ooh, the orange binder. <laughs> Somebody give me a title for my next book. That is my current thing. So this is what I'm working on. It's like an eco-feminist with angels and light. Um, so I don't know what it's going to be called. So that's what I'm working on. It's my next manuscript. Um, I know it's exciting. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait to read it. To have when the it's done, you have to send it to me. I will. I will. Okay. I promise. Um, and then my process used to be, when I had a kid at home, my process was very, you know, they go to bed and I write from like seven, sometimes till one in the morning. Um, now that they're in college, I don't. I don't really have that. When you don't have a lot of time, you, I actually you write more. I feel I wrote write more. Um, so right now, during the pandemic, I started a poetry. I didn't start it. Uh, Rhonda Broach and Mar uh, Marty Solano and I would do Thursday Night Poetry Club. I write really well with friends. I love to get together on Zoom or in person, like Susan Rich and um, find and Melissa Studdard and and write like that. Um, otherwise, I find now I used to be a nighttime writer. I write in the morning. That's when my brain's working with the coffee. With the coffee. With the coffee. I have never tried writing with others. Oh. Um, maybe I would really like that. It's just, yeah. just, I've never really, I mean, maybe in graduate school, you know, Katie Pierce and I would go sit at a coffee shop if we had time um you know between classes or something and work on poems and show things to each other but that was 20 years ago I don't think I've done anything like that since because I've just been holed up in my house with small people yeah you have to zoom with us because we we did it through I zoom. Love that's to what do that. kept us doing it through the pandemic was um it just we were just going to do it once and then it just kept coming back if it's productive yeah I, I'm yeah send me the link I will I'm there um, yeah, I don't have a, I don't have any structure. Um, my kids went off to school this morning on a very cold day and they, the older one walks the younger one. And so I sent them off and I was still in my bathrobe with my coffee. And my daughter who's 13 was like, I can't believe I have to go do standardized testing and you're going to sit on the couch with a book. 
And I was like, it is hard. Like, I feel like if I had a quote unquote real job, it would be easier to like, be like, look, I'm working too, but my work is reading and writing. And so I really do spend most of the day toggling between reading a bunch of stuff, feeding my brain, and then scribbling in a notebook. And if I get far enough in the notebook, I'll carry it over into a Word doc so I could start finding the shape because I can't find the shape on a piece of paper, right? That's just sort of like, like the dump. Um, so yeah, that's sort of where I'm going there. And what I'm working on now, I've written a few poems recently, which has been a, a minor miracle. I'm always convinced that the poem I write is the last poem I'm going to write ever. And so when another one shows up, I'm just like, thank God. <laughs> um, so I've been writing poems, which feels good, but I'm also I'm also weirdly working on fiction right now, which is not oh. something I've ever done, um, but it is coming weirdly fast. And so I'm just sort of trying not to, um, not to get in its way. Wow, it. that's yeah. exciting. Maybe, <laughs> well, we're not. <laughs> Oh, no. Well, you did essays and keep moving. And yeah. so, so and those yeah. wonderful. So I'd love, I always feel like poets like Ocean Vong um, make the best novelist or the best memoirist because prose, just, yeah. it's the attention to sentence. I don't know. I was talking to Kathy Fagan at dinner a few weeks ago and I just said, you know, I've always told myself that I can do this, but I can't do this, this, or this. Mm -hmm. And I've started to kind of dip my toe into things. And I just thought, you know, why aren't we why aren't we writing as wide as widely as we're reading? Right. Like, why not? I mean, why not, you know, why not try something? It may, I may fall flat on my face, but it's fun. Right. And frankly, if writing feels good, one should just do that. Right. Well, that's, I mean, it's, it's play and, you know, the only, well, probably like what we tell our kids is you only fail if you don't try. That's the only time you fail. So and we're not lying to them when we say that. That's actually true. It's very true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we are about at the end of our night tonight. Um, but I'm going to ask one more question anyways. Uh, this is from Marissa. And it says, um, who was your first poetry teacher and who is still teaching you? Oh, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, Linda Beards at the University of Washington. I was a fiction writer and she converted me to, um, to poetry. And my current teacher is probably the environment. Um, I learned from all poets, but right now I feel like um, the natural world and the climate crisis is my biggest teacher and the moment. I thought Allison was gonna ask us to change our eyeglasses. I thought so too. I thought there was going to be a, a, an eyeglass fashion show at the end of this reading. And we'll I, have to I don't know if I'm disappointed or relieved. Oh, don't tempt me. Not. Don't tempt me. <laughs> it's funny. I, I, I didn't have, um, you know, I started writing poetry in high school. And then in college, I had a, a poetry professor. His name is Jeff Peterson, who was sort of like in the language poetry tradition. Mm -hmm. So my first poetry professor was a language poet, which is a, wow. which is a strange entry, I think, into poetry. Um, so, you know, like one of the first poetry books I ever read when I was really writing poetry was like Lynn Haginian's My Life. Wow. Which I love. Like, I still love that book. And I just think like, okay, so that's where, that was the door in. And then um, I would say, you know, in my MFA, Kathy Fagan was my closest mm. um, teacher and someone I'm still, I'm still friends with and like learn from her, learn from, I mean, I, I still seek her wise counsel on things, but most of all, now I learn from her poems. You know, it's like, I could, I could read, I could read The Charm, I could read Sycamore, I could read these books over and over and over again and and still be learning um just learning from the poems themselves so yeah, sycamore is one of my very favorite books oh my gosh i mean she just keeps getting better too which honestly gives me hope it's like hmm. if we saw poets like devolving in middle age we'd be like ooh. 
but they're not like people are actually i think writing their best books in I, late you know in middle age and later and later and later and it's just like that gives me so much hope like let's just keep let's just keep doing this thing yeah that's why we started the two sylvia's press wilder prize for women yes. over 50 because women over 50 felt like they weren't getting, their voices weren't being heard, so. Well, and they weren't. They didn't feel like they weren't. No, they didn't you're work. right. It like, wasn't you know, a feeling. It was emerging, a you know, these emerging prizes, and now they're starting to rethink this, which I'm very glad for. But say 20 years ago, it's like there right. was also an age limit on everything. And it's like, who's to say that like your 20s is the time when you get to emerge, and after that, you better be mid-career. Right. Well, and a lot of women, especially if they go the route of raising children, a lot of times don't discover poetry or writing until their 30s. And, you know, the Yale younger was, like you said, 40 and under. Yes. And it was like, well, passed you by, you know. That's and right. Sorry. Yeah, I love you. Diane Seuss, who is amazing. Diane oh Seuss, my God. Frank. There's someone you should be reading. I didn't say her because everyone's reading her right now, her book, Frank. But she came to poetry, I think she was 40 or 50. Yeah. So... I love that. I mean, and she's just like an oracle. Like I, yeah. she's someone, when I first read Frank, I I was taking pictures of the poems with my phone and texting them to people. <laughs> like in the moment, like I hadn't even processed the poem. I read it one time, I took a picture and it was like, have you seen, like, like you would like a news flash. It was like breaking yeah. news. Have you read this sonnet by Diane <laughs> yeah. So amazing. Oh, thank you, Allie, for putting all these books that we're yammering about. In the There's chat. my other oh, pair of right. glasses. <laughs> oh, wait. Um, yeah, okay. I have ones like that. <laughs> so I'm going to do our little outro, and I dare you to show off all of the glasses that are so similar as okay, I go right. through it. Ready? Glasses right. fashion show. <laughs> okay. On your marks, get set. <laughs> so it is about time that we call it a night, everyone. Um, thank you all so, so much for joining us. This has been an absolute joy. Um, I always love poetry readings. I love seeing you guys all blowing at this chat. This has been such a great night. Uh, for any of you hoping to get your hands on Dialogues with Rising Tides and Goldenrod, I'm going to link them one more time because this has been it's been a long time since they've been in the chat. So there are those. Go ahead and follow those links. Um, and with that... Kelly and Maggie, thank you so much. This has been such a great evening. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to say as we wave goodbye? No, except sorry, I was screenshotting you when, and that was my noise if I interrupted you, but <laughs> <laughs> I had to get the last shot. Thank you so much, Allie and Maggie. This was really enjoyable. I could talk to Maggie for hours. And thank you all for showing up. This was a huge crowd and, and supporting a Seattle book, indie bookstore. Yes, no, this was so much fun. Thank you. All right, everyone. So it is time to say our last good night and do the awkward waving thing. <laughs> so good night, everybody. <laughs>